Welcome to today's update on NASA's human deep space exploration progress, and thanks for joining us here in firing room one in the Launch Control Center at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. With us today are Dan Dumbacher, NASA's Deputy Associate Administrator for Exploration Systems Development, Mark Geyer, Orion Program Manager, Todd May, Space Launch System Program Manager, and Pepper Phillips, Ground Systems Development and Operations Program Manager. And for those of you joining us today on NASA TV and on social media, if you'd like to ask a question during today's briefing, use the hashtag pound at NASA, ask NASA. And with that, we'll jump right in. Dan. Thank you, Rachel. And good afternoon, everyone. And welcome uh, to this uh, little briefing. Uh, first of all, welcome to Central Florida for tomorrow's uh, SpaceX launch, uh, a very key part of our overall integrated exploration mission uh, that includes the crew and cargo resupply for space station, as well as the work we'll be talking about, which is our beyond Earth uh, orbit exploration. Uh, the integration with our brethren, with the commercial cargo and crew, is very important. Uh, they fly tomorrow. Uh, we are working very diligently to our first test flight, which will come up in September of 2014, called Exploration Flight Test 1. And in that flight test, uh, it's primarily to get some good test data for the Orion spacecraft, and Mark will talk about that. But it also is a very good integrated flight test plan where flight test objectives for the Space Launch System, as well as our ground system and our recovery efforts uh, that we will ultimately need for our crewed missions with Orion and the Space Launch System. So it's a very important flight test for us. It's a very key, important milestone for the team and for all of our efforts. And we're looking very forward to that. And you can see some of the hardware here at KSC uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, it is a very key element and of our overall plan to get humans back uh, beyond Earth orbit uh, as quickly as we can. Our next flight test following Exploration Flight Test 1 will be uh, our Exploration Mission 1 in the 2017 timeframe, and we are, the team is working very hard for that. So again, we're excited to be here. We're excited to, to watch the development of the overall NASA's integrated plan for human exploration from International Space Station uh, out to Moon, Asteroid, and eventually to Mars. And we look forward to it, and thank you for your interest. Mark? Right, thank you, Dan. Let's see, so um, as Dan mentioned, EFT-1 is in September of 2014, so that's only 19 months away. So we've got uh, a lot of work going on to get ready for that flight. Um, uh, the picture that we're showing here is actually the crew module, which is being assembled right here in uh, at KSC in the ONC building. Um, that's where all the avionics, the the cables, the tubing, the secondary structure, the heat shield, all the parachutes and everything else, and the service module itself will be installed and assembled right here. Then we'll put the launch abort system on it, uh, and then stack it with a, a on a Delta IV, which is the launch vehicle we're using for this flight. Um, EFT-1 flight will be two orbits. Uh, the second orbit will be very high altitude. We're going to go to 3,000 miles, which is the farthest we've ever taken a, a human uh, spacecraft since we went to the moon um, with Apollo. 3,000 miles, you think about it, it's about 15 times what the space station altitude. Space station altitude is about 200 miles. So it's, it's way up there. And the reason we're doing that is because we get to about 84% of the entry velocity that we would see coming back from the moon. So it allows us to stress the heat shield um, that's going to be very close to what we're going to see when we come back from the, from the region around the moon. We're also instrumenting the heat shield with some uh, state-of-the-art instruments that allow us to actually measure not just the heat but the plasma that we're going to look at, which allows us to make our models on Earth much better so we can make heat shields uh, lighter, safer, uh, more reliable. So this is all part of why we're doing this. We're actually going to exercise seven of the top ten risk areas in the, uh, in the Orion design, including the heat shield. Um, but that also includes parachute deployment, it includes uh, navigation and guidance, it includes all the software they're going to uh, exercise on the flight, uh, as well as um, key areas, like I said, with, with navigation and guidance, and then some separation events. We have some uh, the launch abort system will come off, we have these large fairings on the service module that will be deployed. All these separation events are an important part of the flight, so we're going to test those 
uh, in the environments that we're going to see when we actually put people on board. So they're all real important to us to make sure that we all have these great models, but when you fly it in the environment, does it behave as you expect? And that's why EFT-1 is so important for, for Orion. Um, uh, some things that are not as glamorous as, let's say, hot heat shields and parachute deployment, but we're also reinvigorating the supplier base here in the United States for high-tech parts, titanium parts, composite parts, triple E parts, the avionics and all those kind of things that are, uh, since the shuttle has come down, a lot of these, uh, there's not a lot of business in these areas, and we've reinvigorated that team, recertified people for things, making parts and coatings. That's really a big part, I think, not just of Orion, but also keeping the United States technology edge there. Uh, another interesting thing about um, this program is the data that we get from these um, flight tests not only inform Orion for EM-1 uh, and the other parts of the missions that we're going to go do, but we actually provide hundreds of data products uh, to the commercial providers that Dan talked about that are going to be flying to ISS. Parachute data, heat shield data, aerodynamic database data, uh, facilities that we've gotten prepared that they're going to use. So this is just one of the spin-offs that this program provides for the guys who are going to uh, low Earth orbit. So it's going to be a great flight for us, very exciting. Um, and it's all happening here, right here in Florida. Todd? Sure. So uh, it might not be intuitively obvious why an SLS guy is sitting here for a flight that's going to be on a Delta IV, but as it turns out, um, there's a lot of things about this mission that helps the SLS as well as um, we're helping the mission to be successful. Uh, as, far, as far as the former, uh, it turns out that a lot of the data that Mark's talking about where we're highly instrumenting this is data that we're going to use to understand the structural properties, the aero loading, the environmental loading, the guidance, navigation, and control, the separation loads that we feed back into the integrated stack loads for our first flight, uh, EM-1. Um, it turns out that we're also building uh, an adapter uh, that we deliver to Mark uh, using kind of a Skunk Works team. It, it was a two-year effort, uh, and uh, the picture you see here is actually that, um, that, that we call it the MSA. Um, that's actually a design once, build, and use multiple times. That flies on the EFT-1 flight um, and also will fly on EM-1 and EM-2. Um, and that's actually being built uh, in at Marshall Space Flight Center uh, as we speak. Uh, we're, we're welding the flight article now today. Um, and so there's actually a couple connections here between us uh, on this mission. Uh, SLS is proceeding um, very well right now. Um, we are heading into vehicle PDR this summer. Uh, we have uh, purchased uh, most of the tooling that goes into Mishu. And over this year, those, those tools are going to be installed there, in, including one of the tallest welding machines ever built uh, at over 160 feet tall. Um, we, uh, we also are heading into a time where we will take the J2X off the A1 stand down at Stennis, and we'll reconfigure that for the RS-25 testing uh, to get those engines ready to go on to the first EM-1 flight. Um, as we speak, we're um, putting together the qualification motor for the, for the, um, the booster uh, qualification test late this year, and all those things are proceeding on track, and uh, we're looking forward to being back down here for an event like this in uh, December of 2017. So as the uh, local guy, KSC guy, I welcome you to KSC. Um, I know Dan uh, mentioned that uh, this is where it all comes together, so we're really proud to display what's been going on around the center. Talk about EFT-1 first. Um, so our involvement in that mission is twofold, really. The active part is what Dan mentioned is the landing and recovery aspect. Our team is going to be the one executing that landing and recovery. Of course, we're doing it with the DOD community, so it's our partnership to go out there and recover off the West Coast. Uh, the teams are exercising some static tests now, but we're going to be ready with this first full-up active test with a live spacecraft. And that, what's different is we get to uh, go out and uh, recover parachutes, uh, the forward bay covers. That entire recovery operation is going to be end-to-end -end done on the West Coast. Once we recover, we bring it in inshore and we'll deservice the spacecraft on the West Coast. That's a uh, change from what will be our baseline. Our deservicing op will be back here at KSC as a nominal plan. That deservicing is not ready to be done here at KSC, so we're taking advantage of some assets out west. And then we're going to transport it back over land, back to KSC, so we'll exercise that process and learn from it. 
elsewhere at KSC, we're getting ready for EM1. So if you guys have had a chance to get around the center and see some of the things that are going on, the obvious ones, the ones that are big, you see out at the pad. Um, we're refurbish doing a lot of refurbishment work. So we've just completed some some uh, uh, work like on the uh, hydrogen sphere and the oxygen sphere. Uh, and the water tank, those are big items that you see at the pad that are refurbished. Essentially, we've got a stripped down version of the old pad. The systems that the old systems have come out. Uh, we've we resurfaced the concrete slope. Uh, now we're getting into some of the detailed systems at the pad, the environmental control system, HVAC systems. Those are the ones that are being uh, uh, revamped today. In the VAB, we've uh, removed the uh, platform, the old platform set for shuttle uh, out of High Bay 3. Um, so that effort is, is finishing up. Meanwhile, we're completing our designs in conjunction with Todd's team to make sure we've got a reconfigurable platform set that uh, aligns to his outer mold line and the interfaces that he requires. Elsewhere, of course, there's a big mobile launcher in the uh, East uh, uh, Refurb Park site. Uh, that's come along well. We've uh, uh, got our design uh, near complete on the uh, structural mods that we're going to have to do to that vehicle to reconfigure it from the old Aries configuration to what we're going to be doing for SLS and Orion. Uh, we expect to, in fact, uh, advertise and award a contract uh, this fiscal year to uh, con do the construction on that work. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's a crawler transporter that's right now, uh, craw crawler transporter two is the one we're planning on using for SLS. Of course, we're sing single string, so that's the one we're focusing on. We're using crawler transporter one today to move assets while Crawler Transporter 2 is going through its major mod period. We did have our, uh, back in November, if you recall, we had a, uh, a verification and validation test to some mod work we've done on Crawler Transporter 2. It was really its uh, life extension mods. Now we're going into those things that we require specifically for SLS and Orion capability, which is basically upgrading it from 12 million pounds to uh, eight, 18 million pounds uh, capability. With that, we've got uh, things going on such as uh, roller bearing um, fabrication, uh, primary weight bearing items on the on the trucks on the crawler transporter. So that's in work. Uh, we've got some other activities that uh, we've already completed, st such as modifying the brakes, and uh, and again we've checked those out. So the team here at KSC is excited about EFT One's opportunity to learn. Uh, one one aspect that. I need to uh, point out, since we're sitting in it, is flight following for EFT-1. This room is the room we plan to use for SLS and Orion, and it's being modified to, to support EM-1. We, in fact, are going to use these assets you see in this room for flight following of EFT-1. Um, our team will uh, start actively using these assets and these consoles when Orion powers up. So we'll go through... Uh, power up, we'll go through processing, we're going to go through uh, the launch, we're going to go through the mission sequence and landing and recovery and get data, valuable data that we'll use to enhance and, and help us learn when we build this firing room. So I think that covers KSC. Great. Okay, we'll take a few questions from reporters, and um, if you'll state your name and affiliation at the central mic here, then uh, we'll go ahead. Jason Ryan with americaspace.com. I actually have two questions. I'm not really sure who to field them to. The first one goes to the fact that uh, EFT-1 will be a flight test, and you have mentioned that it will test out the heat shield as well as the parachutes. What other systems that will be used on the manned versions of Orion will be tested out during this flight? Yeah, yeah great question. question. So basically it's a, it's a, it's a ring out of the crew module system. So all the entry navigation and guidance that we do, uh, all the major avionics will be flying, so the boxes will be flying through a high uh, radiation field as well, so we're testing that. Um, just to give you a sense for software, the software takes, we're going to fly about half of the total software we're flying in a manned flight, so it gets you a sense about how many functions we're going to be checking out. But all the, all the, the guidance it has to do on ascent, so we're going to separate the last, we'll separate the fairings, we'll separate uh, the forward bay cover when we enter. So then it's all the parachutes, all the guidance, and then all the way down to the landing. So the only thing that we're really not ringing out in this flight is going to be, and the crew module is going to be uh, the life support system, the pumps, the fans, the seats, that kind of stuff. Well, my second question, I think, is on the minds of a lot of Americans these days. You know, Friday is sequestration. 
And we've heard that while uh, Orion and SLS will pretty much not be touched, we've heard that other elements like the planetary budget and the, the uh, commercial side of the house might be impacted. Will sequestration have any impact on what's going on with Orion or SLS that you're aware of? Well, sequestration, as far as it affects SLS and Orion, will not affect it immediately. We are working to the schedule. Uh, sequestration, as we currently understand it, will affect the NASA budget to the tune of about a 5% hit. Uh, and we've worked very hard to work that into the programs, plan for it, prepare for it. Uh, there will be some impacts, uh, as you mentioned, across, across the agency. Uh, but for SLS and Orion, we're, we're working to hold schedule, at least for the near term, uh, and minimize those impacts. Uh, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. I got a question about EM-1. When can we start to expect to see this, the various stages arrive here, and when would it be fully stacked? It sounds like I lost my mic. Um, our plan is to start uh, processing in the 2016 time frame. So hardware arrives before that in different increments. Most of Todd's hardware will be uh, in the direct path, and uh, I'll call it ship and shoot, uh, or ship and stack is probably more appropriate. Uh, Mark Geyer's hardware, uh, actually the, the first Orion spacecraft that will launch on EM-1, will be uh, several months before that. So. Um, it's roughly the 2015 time frame is when we'll see hardware at KSC. Okay, thank you. And from Mark Geyer, can you tell us a little bit about the work that's going to be done on Orion um, until the end of this year? Thanks. Yeah, great, great. Uh, so already um, all the, the primary structure is here, which is basically the thing that holds pressure, you know, the, the big green thing you might have seen. So now we're outfitting all the, the secondary structure, which we hang the heat shield on, and then we install the tubing for the propulsion system. That's the tubes are starting to show up and we're starting to weld those in. And we're actually building the harnesses in the ONC as well. So what we're doing this year is doing that final outfitting, putting the, the thrusters on, putting the tubing on, welding it, laying out the, the harnesses. And then in July, in the July timeframe, all the computers will have shown up and we'll actually do the first power on of the flight article. So that's, that's what we'll, th those are the big milestones here. Uh, at KSC. At the same time, we'll be finishing the outfit of the service module and bringing the big fairings in. And then, and then later this year, early next part of the year, we'll actually do the stacking of the crew module and the service module and, uh, and finish the last. In Denver, though, uh, just to let you know, our avionics laboratory is in Denver. So we already have all the engineering units of the computers and the power distribution units and the batteries and the guidance and the comm system is already, all the engineering units are already laid out in Denver in the laboratory and we're already we made our first run of the software that's going to actually turn the vehicle on, and we're starting to go through the functional checks in Denver now. So there's a ton going on right now. Yeah. Um, Todd Halverson of uh, Florida Today for Mark Geyer. Um, could you talk a little bit about how EFT-1, the data from that flight, is going to inform the design work you're doing on the vehicle and and whether you know changes might be made because of the uh, data you get get back yeah great great question so uh, i mentioned we uh we have a heat shield design today and we if, i'll give you an example we have a thickness of the ablator material that's the stuff that burns off when you enter and that's all based on models that we of course we started with apollo and we have some uh uh, arc jet chambers here at uh, JSC and also at Ames in California, where we can test pieces, small pieces, right, and see how much they ablate. But until you actually put it into a spacecraft and until you actually fly the profile, you're going to fly, right, it's all based on models. You want to make sure you've flown that in the environment before you put anybody on board. So, and we have a lot of instrumentation, like I said, we're actually going to measure the plasma, the temperature and other properties, which we've never measured before in one of these flights. So that also helps our ground-based models. So that's how, that's the kind of example of how we make sure that we get the best heat shield. And remember, mass is very precious on this vehicle. So we, want, we don't want to have a whole bunch of heat shield thickness that we don't need. So it's part of really optimizing the design so we can do uh, more in the mission and still have a safe spacecraft. Then there's all sorts of uh, loads as well, right? What are the, we, we have models that tell us what kind, what the metal is going to see during liftoff. We have models, what we expect the metal to see in entry and then when it hits the water, but in, we're actually going to instrument all those 
key parts of the structure and measure all that data when we're actually performing the flight. So that's another one to say, is the structure str uh, too strong? You know, did we overdo it because we'll need that mass? Or are we finding any areas in the vehicle where we think we, uh, it's probably too close to the margin? So this really gives us a chance to tweak, I would say, to optimize the design before we actually put anybody in it. So those are two big examples. Um, and uh, how important is it to get that data early on in the design phase? Yeah, yeah so it's huge. Because the later on, the more expensive it gets, right? The, the later on we make changes, and especially if we're making changes and the rocket's waiting for us, let's say we found some problem and they're all ready to go and we're not ready to go and then everybody's waiting on us. So that's why EFT-1 is really important for us to get these high risk areas tested. So if we find problems, we can fix them while they're still in development. So it's really, really important. And, and just one last one for me. Um, Todd, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add that I was just going to add that uh, for the same reasons Mark uh, takes that same data and puts it back into his models, we have integrated stack models that we're looking at on the launch vehicle itself. And as he said, you can do certain things with wind tunnels and things like that to get buffet loads and environmental loads and aero loads and things like that. Um, getting this data back actually helps us validate those models in a way that adds robustness. And if we have to tweak the models, we can do that. So. Uh <laughs> before before you go, Todd, just so you understand the system, mm -hmm. as these guys make trades and make adjustments and changes to their development um, on their uh, particular vehicles, it translates to what services we provide and what capabilities we provide on the ground. So as they mature and as they learn their lessons and make changes early, the easier it is for us on the ground to be able to react and be ready when they're ready. And just one last one for Mark. Um, could you talk about the power up in uh, July, I guess you said, and um, how big a deal that is going to be given uh, the fact we haven't had a power on since last year? Yeah, so, uh, well, it, it's really exciting and not just to computer nerds uh, because uh, you think about it, there's hundreds of channels that have to talk to one another. We're getting a lot of uh, data from the, uh, from the guidance system that the computer has to react to. And then we're also measuring, we have thousands of parameters that we're actually measuring during this flight. So the power on allows us to turn the computers on and then make sure that they're talking to one another and they're getting the data and we have no timing issues. So it's uh, hundreds of channels they have to, have to make sure are working well and that, uh, and that um, the timing is exactly what we expect. So again, we've run, we will have run all that and the procedures out in, in Denver. But what we find is when you actually stick something in a spacecraft and you have the actual flight cables, sometimes you'll find uh, uh, surprises. So that's why we do the, the real power on here in July. So it's a huge test for us. All right. We have a question from Twitter from Jimmy Lynn who asks, how many Orion capsules are planned to be made? Oh, yeah, good question. So if you look, well, let's, let's just talk about through the man flight, which is, you know, in 2021. So today uh, we're also trying to be very um, affordable, cost conscious. So the, the capsule we're going to fly on EFT-1 uh, we're going to fly again on a flight that we call Ascent Abort 2. And Ascent Abort 2 is a test of the uh, launch abort system. It actually takes the launch abort system and puts it in its most stressing environment, which is um, a max dynamic pressure. And we're going to launch that one out of the Cape as well on a small booster. So we're going to reuse that capsule for that very important test. Then EM-1, which is the flight we talked about in 2017, that'll be uh, a flight capsule. We'll fly that, so there, there's the next one in uh, 2017. We'll actually reuse that capsule as well. When it comes back, we'll take it to Plum Brook in, in Ohio and do the abort qualification. We'll take it up to abort loads after we've flown it on EM-1, and then we build a capsule for EM-2. We've also built a GTA uh, in the past, a ground test article, so that's the, you think about that, there's four, and we're going to reuse each of those as much as we possibly can. And we have another question from Twitter from Steven Anderson who asks, when are we going to send personnel back to the moon? Well, when do we go back to the moon is still under study. We're trying to sort out. Uh, we know we're eventually going to Mars, and there are multiple destinations between here and Mars, and we're sorting through what is the best uh, or the best way to approach this exploration. How can we learn? What do we need to learn on our way to Mars, and how can, best can we learn it? And so the moon uh, is one of those destinations, possibly. Asteroids are another possible destination. 
Exploration Mission 1 that we've talked about in, in 2017 and also our first crewed flight are currently planned to go to lunar space. We're going to the lunar, the vicinity of the moon. We are not going to go all the way and land on the moon because we won't have that capability. But we will be going to the area around the moon primarily to learn what we need to know on our way to Mars and also to test out our systems, to test out the Space Launch System and Orion uh, in their environments so that we can prepare our, ourselves for the longer, the longer trips uh, out to Mars. Um, and this probably feeds right into that from Twitter as well from Stone Sasbo that says, what are the current main goals of deep space exploration and what are we hoping to discover? But the current main goal is, is right there in the word. It's exploration. It's to explore the unknown, to learn what we can from the unknown, uh, and to be able to get humans out there with the, with the special expertise and the special ability that the human mind has to be able to look at a given situation and figure out what we can learn about our universe, what can we learn from, from that exploration that can that can feed back into what we want to know better about how to live and work on Earth uh, and how to make our lives all better based on what we learn in, in the sciences and what we learn from that exploration. Uh, we learned a vast amount from the moon. We went to the, uh, fundamentally, we went to the equator of the moon. There is lots more to learn there. Uh, obviously learning more from asteroids and eventually all the lessons we're learning from Curiosity uh, and the Mars rovers, uh, and getting that human mind there in addition to the, to the robots uh, is, is what we're after, and we think we can learn an awful lot from that. What we will learn is hard to predict. Exploration necessarily is exploring the unknown, but we're going there to learn. I, I think there's, uh, Dan talked about, I think, the, the exciting part of the exploration, which I think a lot of us as kids, that's why we're in this business. I think there's another important part about it, too, as well as, as far as national leadership, as far as America being a leader in the world, um, you can see uh, you can see that in other countries trying to accomplish things that we have already done. And I think it's important for the United States to continue to be a leader in that. It's it's okay to lead other countries, just like we're adding ESA to this thing, but to be the leader in that, I think it's important for national prestige and national leadership. Uh, Jason Ryan for AmericaSpace.com again, and uh, we mentioned Mars, and we know that Orion is is, is a larger kind of a version of an Apollo spacecraft. Now, there's been some studies that show that a spacecraft that would take a crew to Mars would have to be the size of perhaps larger than the International Space Station. And we, we've kind of talked about the, the near-term stuff, you know, 2014, 2017, 2021. When it comes to Mars, what are you guys looking at? For what type of craft are you just, you know, penciling in right now or considering? Can you give us some kind of broad strokes on that? I can give you the broad strokes. Uh, and, and we start at Mars and what would a Mars mission look like and then what do we need to learn and develop and capabilities do we need to be able to execute that mission. And we work our way backwards. And we've worked our way backwards to the fact that we know we need an Orion spacecraft to get the crew up to space and to bring them home safely. We know that we need a large launch vehicle to get all the payload up to uh, orbit and into space. And we know that we will have to develop other habitats, other capabilities that are needed to execute a Mars mission. Now, what those habitats, those other crafts look like right now, we don't know. We're studying all the options. But we're also running experiments on the International Space Station, such as the Bigelow Beam Experiment uh, with an inflatable structure uh, that's coming up, uh, hopefully a two-year experiment on Space Station to help us learn and to help us design what those future crafts to Mars will be. Uh, Ken Kramer, Universe Today, for uh, Mark Geyer. Can you talk a little bit about, it, in detail, about the ascent abort test? Uh, when's it going to be? What's the rocket? Where, where is it going to launch? The last we saw, part of the last this morning, will you build a new last? So talk in some detail about that, yeah, please. Right. So again, ascent abort 2 is uh, really to test um, the launch abort system. So you're trying to simulate the launch abort environment. So you wouldn't want to put it on a real rocket because you'd have to blow up the rocket, right, to get you in the right environment. So we're actually going to reuse, uh, it's a peacekeeper stage uh, that we have a deal with the Air Force that we get. 
and we'll ballast it so we get the right environment to get to max Q. So we'll launch it right here uh, uh, in Florida. I can't remember the name of the launch bed. I don't know. 46, 46. So we're refurbing that. Uh, it's obviously it can be much smaller because it's a small stage, and then it's got a launch board system on the top. So it'll have a, we'll have the booster from the Air Force. We'll have a crew module, and then we'll have the launch abort. Um, you saw the abort motor today, but there's also an, uh, a control motor, uh, a jettison motor, and then the fairings. So um, basically, the the booster will get us very fast up to max Q, and then we light the abort. Then we'll do the abort. We'll we'll control the attitude with the ACM and then do the separation and all the parachute tests. So if you think about the pad abort one test that we did a few years ago, it's basically exercising that same integrated system, uh, but in a much more stressing uh, aerodynamic environment. Um, so it'll have all three big solid rocket motors. Uh, EM, EFT-1, the only s active solid rocket motor is the jettison motor, because we're really just going to simulate a, a nominal jettison of the last tower. So we're not putting a, an active abort motor or an active ACM because you'd be wasting the money, you'd be throwing it away. So, Can you talk also about the service module? Uh, ESA is going to build it for the uh, EM-1 flight. It's not really clear to me, though, about EM-2. At the briefing a month or two ago, you talked about using pieces uh, uh, from ESA. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more detail, and would ESA be involved in future uh, service modules beyond EM-1? Yeah, so the current agreement is for the first one so we're uh, we're working with them and they're they're doing a design um, NASA will own uh, the intellectual property for that design so the second one we have options we can talk to ESA about some further deal downstream if there was other things that they wanted to barter and then and, and if the government felt that was the right thing to do we could barter for another one and get the second one or we could take that design and build our own so that's we have time to go figure that out but the, we get we get one as part of the deal, so EM1 will be a, an ESA provided service module. I'm going to kind of follow up on Ken's question there and ask: You worked with ESA on this one, and you know, of course, the budget is a big concern these days. Is NASA looking at other ways to perhaps share the load, so to speak, and gain other partners, kind of like what you've done in the International Space Station? So for for Orion, uh, the service module I see is the extent we have the design and pieces for everything else. So it would be other parts of the architecture. I know Dan and Bill are thinking about some things. And the answer to your question is yes. We are looking for possible partnerships and trying to sort through uh, the various uh, desires of all the international partners. Uh, we have some studies ongoing in that uh, area. And we're looking at all levels of partnership. Uh, it's very clear to us that the international partnership, as demonstrated by the International Space Station, is a key ingredient to a long-term sustainable program. And uh, we are looking for those uh, opportunities. Uh, we are working with the European Space Agency, uh, with the Japanese Space Agency, with the, with the Russians. We're looking, working with all of our international partners uh, for those opportunities. We have nothing yet that's as solidified as what we have with the uh, Orion service module, uh, but we're looking for the opportunities. Thanks for joining us today. Um, to learn more about NASA's human exploration programs, visit www.nasa.gov slash exploration. And we'll conclude with a video that shows progress that we're making towards EFT-1. Space Launch System is the next newest, biggest rocket that we're going to build. And it's not just a replacement for the Space Shuttle. This rocket is going to carry us much further than the shuttle would go. It's NASA's next big rocket for um, deep space exploration. The SLS is a national capability that provides um, a unique access to space that America has not had in 40 years. A large launch vehicle like this um, really opens the door to destinations beyond. It's not limited by destination. It's only limited really by imagination. What we're focused on here at this center is the propulsion system. 
and uh, that consists of two solid rocket boosters and a core with some tanks that feed uh, some liquid rocket engines in the middle. And then the astronauts sit on the top in the Orion um, uh, spacecraft. One of the things we recognized for SLS is we had to be affordable. So we had to do things differently, more efficiently, and smarter. We're all conscious about saving money, doing it uh, more affordable than we have in the past. But at the same time, we can't sacrifice reliability or safety. The system uses a um, significant amount of heritage hardware, which is things that we've evolved from the space shuttle program. The space shuttle had two kind of candle-looking things, which are the solid rockets. Those are kept, and those are used on SLS. We've added a segment uh, to the four-segment solid rocket boosters that we had on shuttle. That gives it more power, more thrust, and it helps this larger rocket get off the ground. What those boosters are for is just to get you going. They burn for a couple of minutes and then they fall to the ground. Then your liquid engines, you're up high enough, your liquid engines can carry your vehicle to as high as you want to go and if you have additional stages, like we're going to have one, then you can go further out into space. Right now the inventory that we've got uh, consists of 14 engines that have flown on shuttle. We've got one engine that was assembled and still needs green run testing or certification testing. We looked at all the spares. As we collected the spares, we determined that we could assemble a 16th engine. So we'll have 16 engines that we'll be able to use for flight. We are making tremendous progress. We've got all of our prime contractors on board. Um, we're testing engines, we're testing solid rocket boosters, our avionics systems. J2X has set, uh, recently set a record at Stennis. Uh, when we were testing, it was the first liquid oxygen engine to get to a full duration test in four tests. We were developing this booster under the Ares program, and, and we're moving that into the SLS vehicle. The motor itself has been through three development firings, which are full-scale motors tested out in Utah, um, um, and we've gotten a lot of good data, engineering data, from those tests. This is an adapter that goes between the bottom of the Ryan capsule and the top of the Space Launch System rocket that we're developing here at Marshall. It's been specifically designed to give strength to the adapter so that it can take the loads in flight and still be lightweight. This shape started out as a series of flat panels. Um, the isogrid pattern was machined into the surfaces. Then they were formed, it was called bump, in a process called bump forming, to make them into the shape that we need here. And we weld three of these segments together to form the cone that you see behind me. We just, uh, you know, delivered the first crew module uh, to the ONC building at KSC. We've started a lot of the uh, parts onto the outside of the uh, CM, and we've actually put it in what we call the bird cage, so we can locate all those parts, you know, within, you know, thousands of an inch to make sure that uh, everything is going together okay putting, you know, wiring inside of it, putting tubes for the, you know, for the propulsion system, putting valves and pumps, and so all of that happens in stages right there uh, in the ONC building. We have uh, on contract with USA, United Space Alliance, to build uh, our harnesses. They're set up shop in the ONC, and so their little shop delivers to, to the big shop. Thermal protection is very difficult in re-entry vehicles to, to test and to model. I mean, really, you have to, you have to fly it to really understand what's going to happen. We're building ceramic thermal insulation tiles for the back shell of the capsule. Uh, we're building thermal barriers for the capsule, and we're building multi-layer insulation for that capsule. I'm the heat shield design lead. So we're designing and building the heat shield for the future Orion missions. The heat shield right now is in uh, our big 20 by 20 router. It's a five axis router. And uh, right now it's machining uh, the interior bowl, if you will, of the heat shield. To cut out that heat shield on the, on the router, it could take weeks of machine time uh, running multiple shifts. 
It's the biggest heat shield uh, ever constructed. The other component is the heat shield skeleton, so that's the piece of the titanium substructure, the backbone that makes up the, the carrier structure itself. Another unique thing is all the hand drilling that we're doing. So it's not automated by a router in this case, and it all has to be, be hand, hand drilled by technicians on the inside. 200 plus titanium parts all match drilled together. So we have a, a tool that puts all the pieces in the right spot and then we drill and high lock them all together. MCC is transforming from uh, supporting space shuttle and space station to a platform that will support space station and MPCV or Orion. In order to adapt to the future, we need to go to a more modern system. KSC will, still, will operate the vehicle all the way up until launch. We'll operate the vehicle until splashdown and the recovery forces come in and take over after that. Fire Room 1 is the launch control room we're going to use for Orion SLS for EM-1 missions. We've been working with the Orion program to get the spacecraft data so we can, we can process it with our software in the firing room and we will be flight following that mission out of Fire Room 1. We refitted the room, we redid it, putting the sound suppression carpeting on the walls, making it kind of a more comfortable place to work. So we're aiming for about 50 people in Fire Room 1 for an EM-1 mission. We are actually using Fire Room 1 right now to test Pad B uh, subsystems. This part is going to be a, almost like a complete new pad because we will have refurbished each and every system that it's inside the pad. We're going to have the vehicle uh, launch from the mobile launcher and not only launch from the mobile launcher but have a tower that, that will have all the services attached to the vehicle. The tower is going to be on the mobile launcher. The vehicle will be assembled at the VAB. It's a return to a concept that we knew that worked very well during the Apollo years when the mobile launch platform had a tower on it. We knew that the VAB was designed to accommodate a launch tower on a mobile launch platform. We have to make sure that the, v the VAB can remain adaptable and accommodate different vehicle architectures. And now we have a clean VAB uh, shell, per se, the, the infrastructure, so that we can accommodate the, the new hardware, the new vehicle access with uh, new platforms. And that is the first phase that we're doing now. And once the vehicle is ready with all the connections, the only thing we gotta do is move the vehicle to the pad do the connections to the mobile launcher. And once we do those connections, we're ready to launch. There was a time where I had to explain what a crawler was. Um, if you didn't work out here at the Space Center or if you weren't in the Central Florida area, a lot of people just, uh, you know, somehow the, the vehicle got out to the pad. We knew what to expect from a, a load perspective with the new vehicle, the larger rocket and things along those lines. And that goes from the crawler lifted load, the hydraulics, also to the crawler way. Um, we're going to have to increase uh, the load capability for the crawler way itself uh, with the rock. What we've essentially done is keep all the same hydraulic components, but just in uh, increase the size, the diameter of the hydraulic cylinders. Last November, we actually took a, took a ride out with the completed crawler 2 out to the pad and tested out the systems and a couple punchless items, but everything worked great. The control system had been upgraded. The, uh, the, cabs, the driver's cab consoles had all been replaced. The brakes had all been replaced. Uh, nearly every subsystem had some kind of work done to it. The traction support elements, uh, each of the, the four corners has 22 rollers that are about the size of a car, to be honest with you. And uh, we're changing out all of those and enlarging those as well. What I love doing is reminding the outside world, whether it's within our government or especially the media, that has a perception that we're in a lull, that there's nothing going on, that, that you know the space program's shutting down, to kind of dispel that rumor and say, no, we're, we're, this is the, the far opposite for us. We are utilizing this inter-program time frame to make all the modifications and all the infrastructure changes that it will help bring that agency vision into reality. Many of us feel the country 
wants to go forward. And, and, and NASA has a big following, and every time I talk to people, they're excited about NASA. Enabling people to go beyond where they have ever gone before and look and discover things that they didn't even know existed is just, it's just a real honor. It's been a pleasure to be involved with this project, and I can't say enough for the team that's put this together. I'm privileged to work this program. I think most people who are working it today feel the same way. I can't believe they pay me for this job. It's just wonderful. It's great. 